Good afternoon, everybody. So welcome again to our subject, Foundations of Special Inclusive Education. So this is the lesson three of our topic in the, the coverage of the midterm examinations in our subject, Foundations of Special Inclusive Education. So previously, you learned about the history, the context, and foundations of special needs and inclusive education. So by understanding the role that disability frameworks play, we can now move on on finding how to implement inclusive practices in the classroom. So for today's discussion, it will provide you insights and practical tips on cultivating inclusive habits and implementing such practices in the classroom effectively. So um, this topic will entirely based on the Booth and Einsco framework to help schools determine their next steps in shifting to a more inclusive settings. So we will talk about the making schools inclusive. So in 2002, Booth and Einsco come up with what we call the Index of Inclusion, so which aims to direct educational institutions toward, I'm so sorry, developing their own next steps and action plans if they want to restructure into becoming more inclusive. So it takes on the social model of disability as its starting point, so builds on um, good practice and then organize the index work around the cycle of activities which guides schools through stages of preparation on the investigation development and review so we have here a three-dimensional framework created so uh, both einsco explained that these three dimensions the creating and inclusive cultures the evolving inclusive practices and producing inclusive um, policies are interconnected and chosen to direct thinking about school change. So consider the backbone of the framework is the lay laying down and establishing of an inclusive culture. So without this at the foundation, it will be quite difficult to get people to shift policies and practices. So a non-supportive culture would most likely result in resistance from the school's direct stakeholders. So they explain that these three dimensions also branch out into sections to further guide schools into implementing more direct steps toward this paradigm shift. So let's discuss first the dimension A, which is the creating inclusive cultures. This is section A.1, the building community, and section A.2, the establishing inclusive values. So this dimension creates a secure, accepting, collaborating, and stimulating community in which everyone is valued as the foundation for the highest achievement of all. So it develops shared inclusive values that are conveyed to all new staff, students, the governors, and the parents and carers. The principles and values in inclusive school cultures guide decisions about the policies and moment-to-moment -moment practice in classroom so that school development become a continuous process. Next is we have the dimension B, which is producing inclusive policies. This is section B.1, developing the school for all, and section B.2, organizing support for diversity. So this dimension makes sure that inclusion parameters parameters all school um, plans so policies encourage the participation of students and staff from the moment they join the school reach out to all students in the locality and minimize exclusionary pressures so all policies involve clear strategies for change support is considered to be all activities which increase the capacity of a school to respond to student diversity. So all forms of support are developed according to inclusive principles and are brought together within a single framework. Our third dimensions, dimension is the dimension C, which is evolving inclusive practices. So section C.1, the orchestrating learning and section C2, the mobilizing resources. So this dimension develops school practices which reflect the inclusive cultures and policies of the schools. So lessons are made respond, 
responsive to student diversity. So students are encouraged to be actively involved in all aspects of their education, which draws on their knowledge and experience outside the school. So staff identify material resources and resources within each other and uh, which other the students the parents the carers and the local communities which can be mobilized to support learning and participation so those are the three dimensions again these are the creating inclusive cultures the evolving inclusive practices and producing inclusive policies so let's discuss further these dimensions the creating inclusive cultures. So inclusion is as much the responsibility of society as it is the responsibility of the schools. So we realize from the previous chapter that the key to successful inclusive practices are merging of frameworks and aligning of definitions of disability. In this discussion, we shall learn that inclusive education is an ongoing collaborative process that needs to be dynam dynamically revisited. So for it to truly work, its essence has to resonate to all stakeholders of the education. In educational reform, stakeholders are those who are invested in the welfare and success of a school and its students. So in other words, these are the teachers, the administrators, the school staff, the officials and other workers, the parents and their families and the community, and also the government. So they may also be the collective entities like the local businesses, the advocacy groups, the media, the social cultural institutions, and other organizations that may be directly or indirectly involved in education. So stakeholders are important because they play a major role in connecting what is being taught in the school to its surrounding community. So the question is, what stakeholders can do? So the right-based approach to educational programming insists that no right can exist without corresponding governmental obligation. So governments and communities are starting to understand how they are accountable to children with additional needs in fulfilling their right to education and providing access to quality education that is also safe, welcoming, and inclusive. So legally defining terms and formalizing a system for setting up inclusive schools in areas where there are none to begin with ensures uniformity, universality, the consistency of implementation, and eventual success of inclusion in the country. So the following are some steps stakeholders can take to create inclusive cultures. So number one is set the parameters for inclusion. So the government has identified key people and professions and highlighted important factors leading to the success of inclusive education. So for example, is um, placement process, the committees, the staffing and responsibilities, the teacher training and compensation, the incentives for private sector participation and collaboration of the Department of Education with other branches of the government. So this clearly showed not just an attempt to centralize inclusive practices, but an initiative to make the welfare and development of children with additional needs the responsibility of all. So there are also consistent with what the UNESCO pushes for in terms of getting every stakeholder involved. Second one is build key people. So the government recognizes the need for teaching training, both in the special needs education and the general education level. So it also pushes for the use of evidence-based teaching frameworks, provision of student assistance, and access to instructional materials. So most importantly, calls are made for continuing research and forming of policies to be initiated by agencies such as the Department of Education so as to further refine the inclusive process and have it tailored to fit to the needs of the children. So um, this is an important also uh, a factor that every nation has to constantly revisit as the needs of students across continents, though similar, would have 
the one says depending on where they reside. So the educational frameworks cannot be lifted and copy pasted with the expectation that what worked for one country will work for another. So according to UNESCO, it stated that the clarity of purpose, the realistic goals, the motivation, the support, the resources, and an evaluation of policies and practices all contribute to a successful shift toward inclusion. Next is identify and eradicate barriers. So UNESCO's Guide for Inclusion advocates for the identification and removal of obstacles that have to do with transforming prevailing attitudes and values on a systematic level. So the Philippine government seems to be in a consonance with this aspect in the light of its existing legislative policies that ground the undeniable importance of the inclusion. So it is also continuously re reorganizing structures in education and implementing programs that highlight the need for primary stakeholders like the school, the parents, and other policy makers to acquire more understanding and capacity building to manage an inclusive environment. Next is um, what stakeholders can do. So these are the common bar barriers to inclusion. So number one is the attitudes, the value systems, the misconceptions, and the societal norms. So this can lead to prejudices and or actual resistance to implement inclusive practices. Next is the physical barriers. These are the lack of building, the facility, the transportation, or road accessibility, these are the types of physical barriers that can literally affect one's mobility. Next is the curriculum, so a rigid one-size-fits-all. So types of curriculum that does not allow room for individual differences can significantly stand one's learning and opportunity for growth. Next is lacks of teacher training and low teacher efficacy. So whether training and teaching strategies, using curriculum frameworks or behavior and classroom management, lack of training as well as low confidence in one's own skills can directly affect how inclusive practices are implemented. Next is poor language and communication. So the language barriers may also directly have implications on how well inclusive practices are implemented. Next is lack of funding. So enough funding can allow for training more teachers as well as coming up with more appropriate programs, instructional materials, or facilities. And lack of funds can be limiting and debilitating to schools. Next is lack of policies. So policies have the ability to unify beliefs and mobilize resources. So unfortunately, Lack of it can become a convenient justification for inaction. Next is organization of educational systems. So centralized systems may have some type of detachment in terms of implementing policies and seeing the reality of how such policies are affecting learners and other stakeholders. Next is too much focus on performance-based standards. So, schools have also reportedly refused inclusion because of fear that the presence of learners with additional needs will pull down their rankings in standardized tests. So, those are the common barriers to inclusion. So, let us now proceed in discussing the special education versus mainstreaming versus inclusive education. So part of what needs to occur when creating culture is to also determine distinctions among frameworks and practices. So most important in this scenario is to understand how different special education, mainstreaming, and inclusive education are from each other. In our previous chapter, we discussed how special education is often regarded as segregated and inclusive. So it has to be noted, however, that this perception is entirely due to its nature of addressing cases in a highly individualized way. So this is not to mean that special education is an environment that violates human rights because special education 
assess, instruct, and evaluate students individually and intentionally. So this type of educational setting is beneficial to those with very unique needs as well. So mainstreaming shares more similarities with inclusion than with special education. So both look at integrating the child with additional needs into a general education setting. So there are, however, no one says between the two as well. So we have here a table that shows the uh, that compares the three, the special education, the mainstreaming, and the inclusive education. So as you can see, in terms of learners, in, in special education, students who are not part of the classroom norm. In inclusion, all same aged peers learners are in one class regardless of ability. In mainstreaming, selected learners are included in a general education class based in their readiness instead of their age. In terms of curriculum, in special education, strengths-based and needs-based individualized curriculum. In inclusion, the general education curriculum and in mainstreaming, learner may have access to both general education curriculum and a more individualized curriculum. In terms of assessment and evaluation, mostly strengths-based but it sometimes is also standards-based. It is uh, in inclusion, it is only norm reference, and in mainstreaming, both norm reference and strengths based. In learning placement and delivery services, all services happen inside the special education classroom, but other services such as therapeutic interventions may be integrated into this setting or delivered separately. In inclusion, all services happen inside the general education classroom and in mainstreaming, receive services in both the general education classroom and outside through the use of resource rooms and therapeutic programs. Lastly, in terms of philosophy. In special education, we use the learner-centered. So some learners have very specific needs that may not be appropriately addressed in general education classroom. Next is in inclusion, we have the rights base. All learners have a right to, ac to assess or access quality education that is available to others and mainstreaming preparatory and integrative. So learners are given access to general education but will need to catch up on skills first. So let's now proceed to the second one. Uh, producing inclusive policies. So as reiterated in um, our previous uh, discussion, the premise of inclusion starts with an acceptance and embracing of diversity. So it is difficult to start movement if this practice is not rooted on a culture that assumes the right perspectives and values. So for simultaneous paradigm shifts to happen among its education stakeholders, the schools must first create a new culture. So um, according to UNESCO, realistically acknowledges that so the societal change in attitude need not be initially present in a community before inclusion can be fully practiced. So rather, it must be viewed as a perspective or an ideal to work together. So without this realization, differences in standards and quality of education may surface as potential problems. So just very recently, the pre-service education curriculum was restructured so that the special needs education units are not only given to special needs education majors, but to other education majors as well. So this is a huge step for teachers and a nod to inclusive education. So we have here a following list of other possible steps that educates that educators can take to facilitate the much-needed societal shift and inform policy. Number one is involve other sectors of society. So current training and awareness campaigns seem to limit the movement of inclusion to a mere homeschool relationship. So at most, these are extended to the departments of social welfare and health. So, however, for an inclusive setup to truly be successful, active involvement of the entire community must be ensured. For instance, those in the business 
commercial, security, and religious sectors may also be given representation in trainings. So these campaigns must be wide enough in scope as to cover supermarkets, the restaurants, the malls, the public and government agencies not directly associated with social welfare or health, transportation, the land, the airline and maritime companies, the media, and even the research teams of our policymakers. So at the same time, they must be specific enough to reach the local churches, the subdivision playgrounds, and the village stores. So in recent years, students in the tertiary level from various programs have been showing growing interest in the PWD community. So for instance, students belonging to architectural and interior design programs have been working on this and thesis and capstone projects where their main clients have additional needs. So the idea is for everyone, regardless of their training or exposure, to become more sensitive and aware of the PWD population. So the more aware a community is, the more it will be able to help. Next is collaborate. So whether creating an academic program is specific to a child with additional needs or creating a new legislative bill for the PWD community, collaboration is crucial. So each member of the inclusive education team would have their own strengths and weaknesses. And this have to be used wisely to benefit the child with additional Needs. So according to Del Coro Tianco states that general education teachers are trained in the general curriculum but would not know how to teach and manage children with additional needs, while a special needs education teacher would be equipped to handle atypical behaviors but would not know much about the general education curriculum. So through collaboration would guarantee an inclusive education that would cover as many areas as possible. Next is we have uh, recognized the shift in roles of the teachers. So with the shift to inclusive education, the role of special education teachers suddenly seems to be reduced to only as needed. So as a result, the SPED teacher's role no longer becomes that of an implementer but that of a consultative nature instead. So it also becomes the responsibility of the general education teacher to know what to do when faced with a learner with additional needs in his or her classroom. So the SPED teacher's role, their trainings, their insight, and their skills as a supposed a prime mover in the inclusive education framework. So must be neither be diminished nor disregarded. So instead, this must be used to ensure a good inclusive program is provided to children with additional needs. So conversely, general education teachers must go through skills training and capacity building workshops to ensure that they are supporting all types of learners in their classrooms appropriately. Next is include transitions in planning. So, an abrupt systematic change that is not well planned or that disregards practices, whether existing or implied, may hinder the shift to inclusion and cause resentment from all stakeholders. So, instead, a current practices have to be respected and honored so as to facilitate a gradual shift to inclusive education. So, both and Iron Score recommend the schools reflect on their current policies and practices to check their readiness for an inclusive setup. So they also devised a questionnaire that will have um, administrators, the faculty, and other stakeholders comprehensively gather baseline data. So a move that would greatly help in informing policy would be to examine different aspects of the school and the delivery of its services. So specifically, schools may look at the following. Number one is the student admissions, the accessibility to utilities and facilities, supports available to students, parents, and, ad and school personnel, the learner ac accommodations, the exclusionary or discriminatory incidents, and number of bullying cases, the faculty and staff promotion. So, um, those are the factors in producing the inclusive policies. So the third dimension, which is the which is the evolving inclusive practice, will be discussed in the next um, recorded discussion. So please finish and watch watching the first part or the part one of 
this discussion. And in the part two, I will discuss further the three the third dimensions, which is the evolving inclusive practice. And if again, if you have any questions regarding our discussion, the part one discussion, um in the subject the include the foundations of inclusive and special education please don't hesitate to uh, message it in our official group chat so again i will repeat it all over again don't message me using personal message i don't accommodate personal message if you have concerns again please chat it in our official group chat so thank you very much and see you in a part two